Hi everyone. So today we'll uh, talk about the uh, behavioral design patterns. Uh, basically, we'll con we continue the topic of design patterns that we started two or three weeks ago uh, with creational design patterns and structural design patterns. Behavioral design patterns are all about communication. How do you actually implement a workflow or communicate between multiple entities? And uh, moreover is how do you actually modify the behavior dynamically, even at runtime without modifying pre-existing uh, code. So all these design patterns that we will discuss about today and uh, uh, in the next class, we'll probably do three today and three in the following class, are about identifying common communication patterns between objects and realizing these patterns. They increase the flexibility in carrying out communication and also by avoiding modifying pre-existing code. Mostly, you basically, there are ways to implement additional concrete classes using inheritance and composition in order to basically modify the behavior without updating or modifying pre-existing code. So we'll actually talk about six behavioral design patterns. Uh, the strategy pattern are basically algorithms that can be selected on the fly. You can modify the algorithm by co uh, using composition. In fact, it's not necessary that you implement these design patterns with composition, but it's much uh, more straightforward to implement them with composition instead of inheritance. Then we'll describe about the template design pattern or template method pattern. Uh, you describe the a program skeleton using uh, uh, an abstract class. Uh, you can leave unimplemented methods or even methods that are empty in the, in the parent class. And then using inheritance, you actually implement in different ways these methods. The observer pattern is a standard pattern using graphical user interfaces, like for instance, GUIs where an, are objects that register to observe an, an event on another object. So event listeners are such examples. You have the event listener is an observer of the actual object, which is the model that if it gets modified or an event happens on that model, the event, the observer observes that event and it basically reacts to it, modifies the data, uh, modifies the UI and so on. In fact, we'll actually get into even more complicated observer patterns, the model view controller. The model for a table, for instance, is actually the data that is stored in that table. The view is actually the graphical user interface component that shows that table. The controller actually is the event handler that in case that that view is modified, like a cell in the table is modified, the controller basically catches that event and modifies the model. So basically the controller modifies the model, the state of the model modifies the view, the view actually uh, when it's modified by the user uh, is that is captured by the uh, controller. So it's a standard use of observer pattern. Everybody basically the view is observing the, uh, the model, the controller is observing the view and the model is observing the controller. Then we'll also have next class, uh, three more behavioral design patterns. The command pattern where basically you implement as strings, uh, an action and the parameters to that action. This is kind of like uh, what you have in a shell. A command is basically a way to interact with the shell to uh, do operations. The iterator pattern is a standard iterator where you basically abstract a data structure and the ways to actually iterate through the element elements or access the elements of any data structure by actually standardizing how do you iterate over the, over the data structure. So this is a standard iterator in data structures like lists and trees and graphs. And I can actually get into more details about how inter iterators are implemented uh, in, uh, in uh, different languages. In Java, particularly, where you have an iterable object that returns the iterator and the iterator implements the three standard methods. 
next, has next, and remove. Remove is kind of kept for historical reasons, but it basically allows you to iterate over objects and delete or remove the elements that, uh, some elements. And finally, we'll actually have another design pattern called a state pattern, which is a clean, clean way to implement uh, a state change, uh, uh, basically an automata uh, at runtime. So in our uh, textbook, basically we had covered the creational design patterns, which were factory, singleton, builder, and prototype. The structural design patterns, which were not about the creation on pop of objects, but how do you actually uh, create classes in, in uh, again, in a, uh, a pro an object-oriented program in such a way that it minimizes changes if you actually uh, want to maintain the program. So we talked about, for instance, the adapter pattern that you have a new uh, interface or a new library, but the original class stays unmodified. You can actually implement uh, another library on top of it. So you can basically adapt from the new interface to the old interface that was used. And similarly, other structural design patterns, decorator, which basically uses uh, decoration of a previously, obje uh, previously defined objects to add additional features or pro uh, properties at runtime. Facade, which was a simplification of the interface. Flight weight, which was basically uh, an efficiency pattern to kind of a hack to only keep one object when you actually need multiple objects of the same type and bridge. So we start with the strategy pattern. So let's assume that you want to implement uh, a family of algorithms. And these are general algorithms. Basically, you want sorting or you want uh, update of a graph. But you want the algorithm to vary independently from how the clients use them. They are also this kind of uh, design pattern is also called an algorithm in a box. Basically, you place the essential steps of the algorithm in an interface called the strategy interface. And the different methods in this interface implement the different parts of the algorithm. Then you had you use composition has a uh, to actually imp to actually define what are the methods that we we will actually use uh, the concrete methods in the case of, uh, that, of classes that implement that interface type. So you have an interface that actually implements, uh, defines the standard methods used in the algorithm, and then you have actual concrete classes that implement those various in, uh, methods, abstract methods. Now, the advantage of strategy pattern, as you will see, is the fact that you can actually determine at runtime which method actually is called for that specific concrete object. Okay. So let's start with an example. It basically, the, the idea of a strategy pattern is that instead of using inheritance, pure inheritance, we are going to use composition. So we have, let's say an abstract class duck and the duck has multiple behaviors, basically a fly behavior, a quack behavior. And these are actually delegated to other classes. So you have a fly behavior interface that defines the method fly, which is implemented by uh, fly with wings, no fly, and other concrete classes that implement that specific behavior. Similarly, the quark behavior is implemented in, in an interface, which defines the abstract method quark. And then you have different uh, quark uh, concrete classes. So you have quark, squawk, and mute quark. Now, when you create actually subclasses, concrete subclasses of the duck uh, abstract class, you basically can define the classes without having to have uh, uh, properties, basically uh, standard properties, because you are using this composition for the different types of behaviors for flying and quacking. So a malar duck will basically delegate the fly behavior to fly with wings and the quack behavior to a standard quack class. 
uh, Red Hat Doc will basically also use uh, different concrete classes in this composition to delegate the different types of flying and quacking. Similarly, a rubber duck, for instance, doesn't fly, so it delegates the fly behavior to no fly and the quack behavior to squeak. So the advantage here is that you don't need to implement these different methods in the subclasses of duck. You are delegating these uh, behaviors to actually uh, composition based other classes, concrete classes. So you can basically think of the behaviors as a family of algorithms and you are using one certain algorithm for that family. So let's, the same idea could be used for, let's say that you implement um, a binary search class and this binary search delegates the sorting to different sorting methods with different uh, uh, efficiencies like uh, quick sort or merge sort and the search behavior to a search interface, binary search, linear search or other types of searches. So a client would basically compose the different steps of the algorithm using basically composition. So let's go over this example. So basically we'll define our strategy example using this uh, example of uh, duck, abstract duck, and which has two different uh, properties, the fly behavior and the quack behavior. And when basically we invoke the method for flying or for quacking, we actually invoke the fly and quack in those different types of behaviors. Then we have the fly behavior uh, interface, which is implemented by multiple subclasses, fly with wings, just flies with wings, uh, fly no way, does, cannot fly. Then we have the quack behavior interface, which also delegates the quack method to various concrete subclasses of quack. Quack that implements quack behavior actually quacks. And uh, another one, basically, let's say squawk uh, also uh, prints different messages. Now, the malar duck extends the quack abstract class by implementing basically using the fly behavior to flying with wings and the quack behavior to the actual uh, class quack. A rubber duck is also basically a, a, an example of a duck, but it doesn't fly. It's a rubber duck, a yellow rubber duck, and the quack is, uh, is quick, let's say. It, it also delegates the quack to uh, a, a, a concrete subclass of the quack behavior. So now the example per se creates two different ducks, a uh, malar duck, and we invoke the methods fly and quack, which of course for a malar duck, it will delegate to these two additional separate concrete classes. And the rubber duck also calls the methods fly and quack, which basically delegates to these two composed classes for fly behavior and quack behavior. So really the idea is that you are using delegation to actually implement steps of the algorithm or different steps of, uh, of uh, different methods. Okay, so let me actually show you this example. So this strategy example uh, of creating the two different types of ducks. And if we run it, we basically have for a, fly, for a malar duck that it flies and it quacks and for a rubber duck that it cannot fly. So really the idea is of using delegation. They are extremely useful. This idea of using delegation is useful in graphic user interfaces when you want to delegate the layout manager to a different class. So I assume that most of you that went through 114 or uh, probably 316, you saw graphical user interfaces and in actually 316 is this class. So. You haven't seen because we haven't covered Java FX or Swing. But basically the idea is that when you develop a standalone uh, application, either in Java or other programming languages, you choose for your UI a layout manager. 
So the layout manager is a separate class from the stage or the panel that you are actually showing. And that separate class, which uses composition, actually defines how the objects are laid out, displayed in your interface. So it's a standard example of strategy design pattern of delegating certain functions to uh, uh, composition classes. Okay. So the idea of this strategy design pattern, and actually I will get later in this example of uh, Java UI or other graphical user interfaces is that you're using composition instead of inherit uh, inheritance to delegate the behavior how the different objects get their behavior to a different class by using composition. So basically for this kind of job uh, need, a uh, has a hierarchy, a composition relationship is better than an is a inheritance relationship. In our example, basically each duck has a fly behavior for the behavior of flying and the quack behavior to delegate the flying and quacking. It also allows change at runtime uh, to basically, as long as the object uh, implementation has the correct, implements the correct interface. So what I mean by that is that we see that uh, a malar duck extends duck and duck has these two properties, fly behavior and quack behavior. So even at runtime, I can change the fly behavior. So for instance, for a malar duck, I can do something like this, duck dot fly behavior is, and now we can basically define a different fly behavior. Like for instance, maybe this is a sick malar duck fly no way is the fly behavior. So the idea is that even at runtime, I can change the behavior to another behavior defined in another composition class uh, without having to modify the, the implementation of a malar duck. Because actually the behavior of flying is delegated. So really I can do it at runtime without uh, having to modify the code at all. Okay. So it allows changing the behavior at runtime. Okay. Another example. So for instance, you want to implement a calculator and uh, instead of using inheritance for the operation that you want to implement, you can actually use composition or delegation for the operation that you want to implement. So basically we can implement a strategy interface and this strategy interface could be like the standard operation that you want to implement, which takes two integers uh, in an execute method and returns an integer. But it doesn't define what operation you want to implement. It can be addition, multiplication, subtraction, division, and so on. And then you implement the different strategies, uh, the add strategy, implement strategy, and executes basically the method by adding the two parameters, A and B, and returning the sum. Uh, subtract strategy, uh, subtracts B from A. A multiply strategy uh, multiplies A with B. Then you can define a context class, a separate class that uses composition, a strategy object a property uh, of the type strategy to define what is the actual uh, strategy that is used for executing uh, that strategy for uh, two integers A and B. And you can see all that it basically does, the execute method in the context, it calls the strategy execute method. So now in a calculator class, this is our main uh, driver class, we can basically create multiple contexts. So for a context that has an add uh, behavior, uh, when we execute the strategy for that context for three and four, it sums three and four. Similar, this exact same code context.execute strategy. If the strategy has a different context, which is a subtract strategy, it will basically subtract four out of three. And similarly, for another context where you delegate the operation to a multiply strategy, 
uh, executing the strategy for three and four returns 12 because it basically multiplies the two objects. So instead of implementing uh, basically the different operations using inheritance or different methods, uh, we basically implement the calculator using delegation. We delegate to a strategy in either an add or a subtract or a multiply the operation of what we actually want to execute. Okay, so again, I have an example of this calculator. So basically I implemented the various strategies for execution in the add, in the subtract and multiply concrete uh, composition classes. And then I define the context which contains a strategy uh, delegation composition object and then in the main method, I basically invoke the strategy for an add, subtract, and multiply object. And if we run it, the first one will basically return the, the result of addition. The second one will return the result of subtraction. And the third one, the result of multiplying three and four. So it's really the whole idea of uh, the strategy design pattern is delegate the execution to an interface, to a compo composed uh, property. And as I said, strategy patterns are actually used again in the Java API. Layout managers in Swing or in Java FX are basically a way to delegate the, the how objects are laid out in the graphical user interface to a different class. So layout managers are actually added at uh, uh, runtime to a component that is of the type Java uh, panel. And it, these layout managers are an external class that describe how to arrange the components in the current uh, uh, container. So these components can be added or removed from the container and the layout manager automatically resizes and positions the components it manages. And I will show you an example. For instance, any container that extends the component uh, uh, class in Java, in Java Swing, uh, contains a list of all of the components and, and, and it contains a, a link, a, a reference to a layout manager. So basically the layout manager is the one that actually defines how the components are uh, arranged in the graphical user interface. And this is done at runtime by setting the layout manager for the current container to a different layout manager. Okay. And here is an example. If you have a J panel, you can set the layout manager to be a flow pane, uh, a flow layout, and you can add the different buttons. You can set it to be a, a vertical box layout or an horizontal box layout or a, a grid layout or a border layout, any kind of layout to a different using delegation to a different class. So it's dynamic interchange at runtime. You can basically change even the different layout based on the user inputs. Okay. So the whole idea of the strategy design pattern is that you are delegating certain steps through composition to a different uh, hierarchy, you, which usually implements uh, an interface. So that's the strategy design pattern. Do you have any questions about the strategy, strategy design pattern? Let me check the chat, nothing. Ah, okay, so uh, a question is about the layout manager. So in JavaFX and also uh, in uh, not JavaFX, all in Swing mostly, uh, you have one class called JPanel, which is basically the different panels that you put in a graphical user interface. But this panel doesn't contain the way that these objects are put in the window. So the flow layout puts the objects one after another until the end of the window and then it goes to the next row, puts the objects from left to right. So it starts from the top left corner and puts flow, uh, the flow layout puts the objects one after another. 
The vertical box layout is basically just puts the objects on a single vertical column. Uh, an horizontal box layout on a, uh, a single row, on a single line, okay? Now, this is not defined in the panel per se, in the class that actually is the container that is the window that you are actually looking at. It's defined separately in uh, basically a different class, which is added, a different object that is added at runtime to the panel. So you set out the layout is basically like that behavior that we saw for uh, the duck or uh, flying duck or quacking duck. Instead of implementing that as a sub method in a method in the subclass, you are delegating it to a different class. So the flow layout is a separate object that will dictate how the objects are positioned within the components are positioned in your graphical user interface. So it's delegation of a responsibility to a different class. If you want, I could get into a little bit more detail. I just need to find uh, my lecture notes for swing. Give me just a moment. I have examples of using swing, but unfortunately I don't have it. I don't think I do have swing anymore. I have a very simple example of using uh, Java FX, uh, Java X swing, but it's not using layout managers. The default layout manager for a panel, uh, for a, a J panel is flow layout. So yes, so basically just to understand the idea of a manager is that you have a, pro a property in your current uh, container of, or window, which actually arranges the objects in the window, how the, these objects are displayed in the window. And this is delegated to a separate class, the separate object. So it's not implementing through inheritance, it's implementing implemented through delegation. And that object, the flow, the layout manager dictates how the objects are arranged in the class. Okay. Okay, next type of design pattern, behavioral design pattern that we'll discuss about is called the template method pattern. It basically, the idea is that this uses inheritance. It defines the skeleton of an algorithm, deferring some steps to subclasses. Uh, it lets the subclasses implement those uh, steps independently from the, super, from the uh, parent class. So the, the textbook uh, gives the following example. There is a coffee house a uh, beverage uh, uh, company, let's say, Starbucks, that uh, makes multiple beverages. And these beverages are similar. For instance, for coffee, you boil some water, you brew the coffee in boiling water, you pour the coffee in the cup, uh, you add the sugar and milk. For tea, you boil the water, same step as above. Instead of brewing the coffee in boiling water, you steep the tea in boiling water. Instead of putting the coffee in the cup, you put the tea in the cup. Instead of adding milk and sugar, you add lemon. So the idea is how do we implement these algorithms? The algorithms are quite general, are similar, uh, and eliminate code application. Basically, you don't want some methods that are the same boiling water to be implemented in two different uh, beverages. Instead of having it in one single abstract class, higher level class, and then letting the subclasses to implement those methods that are not common, that are not in both types of beverages. So basically 
the whole idea of this template method pattern is that you implement an algorithm. Some steps are common, so you implement them in the same way. Some steps are different, and then you leave them to the subclassing. In some respect, you can basically think of the template method as basic inheritance, but not quite. You are implementing a higher level algorithm in an abstract way in the abstract class, and then you implement the steps in the subclasses. So it's a standard use of inheritance, not quite standard inheritance. So we have an abstract class caffeinate, uh, caffeine beverage, which has a method prepare recipe, is basically the template method, which has the steps of uh, preparing a recipe, boil water, brew, pouring cup, and add condiments. Some of these methods are implemented at the level of the abstract class caffeinated beverage, like boiling water is standard, boil the water, uh, pouring in cup is standard, pouring cup. Some of them are abstract at the level of prepare recipe and they are less left to subclasses. Brewing is different for coffee and tea. Adding condiments is different for coffee and tea and maybe some different types of tea. Then you can implement through inheritance uh, these properties. So T extends caffeinate, uh, caffeine beverage by implementing brewing, by steeping the tea and adding the condiments by adding the lemon. And coffee extends the caffeine beverage by brewing, being dripping the coffee through the filter and adding condiments, adding the uh, milk and sugar. So basically standard inheritance, but you are implementing those standard methods that you saw at the higher level at the abstract class. So you're delegating, but not through delegation, but through inheritance, the actual implementation of some of the uh, uh, methods to the subclasses. So you rely on subclasses and implementation, concrete implementation of some steps to the subclasses tea and coffee. And you basically, the two methods that we are delegating are brew and uh, add condiments. So one thing that we saw at this caffeine beverage is the fact that you have a general algorithm and this algorithm has the steps of that general algorithm. Then some of the methods are common to all of the uh, different subclasses and therefore they will be implemented at the level of uh, the super class and some methods basically are left to uh, be su supplied by the subclasses. Okay. So basically I was checking the chat and I saw there is an interface for boil and the interface for uh, pouring and adding. Yes, you can do that too. Uh, in fact, I will show you uh, different ways to implement the template method in a couple of minutes. So this is basically just refreshing that idea that uh, a tea is a caffeine beverage and preparing the recipe will call the main method for preparing recipes in caffeine beverage. And those methods will basically invoke the various methods in uh, that algorithm. Boiling water is actually a method in caffeine beverage. Brewing is a method in tea. Uh, pouring in cup is a method in caffeine beverage and adding condiments is a specific method to tea. So the template method pattern, basically you have a template method, which is a set of steps like primitive operation one, primitive operation two. Uh, and then you can implement some of the methods at the level of the abstract class and some of the methods in subclasses. That's the template method and uh, basically delegating to inheritance the methods to subclasses. And this is the usual standard template for a template method. Basically you have an abstract class that contains uh, usually a final uh, template method. Final methods cannot be uh, sub, uh, in, uh, overridden by subclasses. Then you have some of the steps are implemented by the subclasses and some of the steps like a concrete operation is implemented at the level of uh, 
the abstract class. Now, some of the methods implemented in the abstract class are actually uh, implemented there, and some are totally empty. Those are called hook methods. So a hook method is a concrete method at the level of the abstract class, which does nothing. Basically, it's an empty method. And the idea of these empty methods is that they are standardized by the abstract class, but there is no constraint that the subclass must implement it. So a hook method is a special method declared in the abstract class as empty or some default implementation. That gives the subclasses the ability to hook into the algorithm at various points if they wish by implementing that method at the level of the subclass. A subclass is also free to ignore the hook because the hook is a concrete method, is actually a method that is empty. So it doesn't require it like abstract methods to be implemented by the subclass. So really a hook is an empty method in the super class, in the parent class, which will be implemented in the child class, in the subclass. So in the case of caffeine beverage, if we return back to this code, we basically have the various methods for boiling water, brewing, pouring cup. And if the co uh, customer wants condiments, then we can have also a hook method. Like only if this is true, then uh, we implement add condiments. We call add condiments. And really this method could be a hook method. Basically it's a Boolean method that it always returns true. But if the subclass wants to override it with return false, then that will basically ignore, will go to adding the codiments. So we basically will have to call that method. Okay. So it's really like a, a, a guard method. It's a guard method that if it's true, if it's implemented by the subclass, then it's not always true. So it gets into the add condiment, but if it's not implemented by the subclass, it's true because basically that's the default implementation. So this is another example of hook, but it is a hook which has a default implementation. So it's not totally empty. It's basically a specific type of hook. Okay. Now, if you want to try the complete class caffeinated beverage for this template method pattern, is totally available in the lecture notes. So I will actually show it to you again in Eclipse. So this is the Starbuzz uh, template method. So we have caffeine beverage, the template class, we which has the template method for boiling water, brewing, pouring cup, and adding condiments. I included a hook example. Then I have two methods which are concrete in caffeine beverage and two methods that are abstract. And then I have two hooks, basically two empty methods. And this, it's optional for subclasses to implement them. So in one of them, actually, I implement the hook. Do you like coffee? Uh, in the other one, I implement the other hook. Uh, water has, uh, hook, water has boiled. Okay. And again, if you want to run it, you basically can run it and what this does, it basically creates a beverage that is a coffee, and then I call prepare recipe, and then a beverage that is tea, and then I call a prepare recipe. So the first one is the coffee, boiling water, brewing, pouring, uh, and then adding the milk and sugar, and the hook asks, did you like the coffee? For, for uh, tea, we have a similar algorithm, boiling water, uh, brewing by the tea, uh, water is uh, boiling, uh, it's uh, putting the tea bag in the water, then pouring the fluid in the cup and adding sugar and honey. So we are not using that other hook, the, the hook that actually gets invoked in the algorithm. So really the idea of the template method is uh, using subclasses to implement an algorithm with multiple steps. The difference between strategy pattern is that in strategy pattern, you encapsulate the behavior using composition. So you delegate the behavior to a proper reference uh, uh, class. 
And in template, you have an algorithm and the steps are implemented by the subclasses. So you basically use inheritance to implement the steps. So there are two different uses of uh, basically delegating the behavior either through uh, reference or composition or uh, through inheritance. Another example for uh, the template method is a game. Usually games or board games implement this kind of uh, behavior where basically you have the, an algorithm of playing the game. Usually all games have the same kind of steps. You initialize the game, then there are a turn taking between multiple players, and then you print the winner at the end. And based on the different types of games, so mon mon a Monopoly game implements its own initialized game, its own uh, method for, for instance, for ending the game or printing the winner, as opposed to a chess game that implements a different initialization, uh, turn by turn playing, end of game and printing the winner. So really the idea is that through inheritance, you implement a complex algorithm. You try to abstract the steps of the algorithm in a, a, a algorithm a template method, and then you implement the steps in, in using inheritance. Okay. So those are the two ways to delegate the behavior through composition or implementing a method through inheritance. The next type of design pattern, which probably is the most important behavioral design pattern that we'll discuss about today, is the observer design pattern. And is mostly used in graphical user interfaces, but not only. Uh, is used in uh, push notifications for, for instance, for your Android uh, games or basically applications when you want to see the weather or you want notifications if the weather is bad or uh, the stock market, something happens on the stock market, that's the standard observer design pattern. So you have an application that is the observer to an object that could be the weather station or could be the stock market. Okay. So how does this work? Basically, your phone or your application is uh, registering as registers as uh, an observer for that, let's say, common weather station. The weather station keeps a list of all of the observers that it will have to notify in case that the state changes. So instead of polling every single second, the, the web server, if there is an update, actually the web server or the server is the one that calls from a list all of the uh, uh, observers, all of the registered observers. So it's a quite useful design pattern. Okay, It's also used in graphical user interfaces. So it's a really, the way that you, sh you, you can define it is a one-to-many dependency. There is one observed state and many observers that want to look at that state and be notified when an event happens in that state, some state change. So, and the idea is of for the observer pattern is that the object changes its state. Like for instance, now the weather changes and all of the dependents are notified automatically and updated, okay? Where you have seen this, for instance, in GUIs, you have a table in a, a model and uh, you basically update a cell in the table. Immediately the viewers, uh, those basically waiting interfaces that are uh, objects that are waiting for a change are notified so they can basically execute the listener method, okay? So in all our GUIs, uh, this, there is what is usually usually called a state manager that calls the methods uh, when the uh, app is changed and it forces the uh, to update, to call the listeners and maybe also update the interface, the GUI itself. So I will give you a standard example. You have uh, weather data. And this weather data is uh, observed by multiple interfaces, okay? 
So you have a weather data object that will is observed by multiple displays, uh, an iPhone, uh, uh, an iPad, an Android phone and so on, smartphone and so on. Now this data object pulls the data from a weather station and the weather station measures through sensors, the humidity, the temperature and the pressure. So first thing that we have is the observable object. The observable object basically contains a list of all of the observers that registered with it. So it's a standard array list. And basically there are standard methods for such a, a template. Publish, which basically it takes a, a, a new data object. And for every single observer, that is observing the current object, it updates uh, uh, for every single observer, it calls the method update on that observer. So really the idea of publishing is that all of these observers are waiting in a list to be notified when the object changes. Okay. You can subscribe to the, to the observable object. So when a new observer is uh, uh, created, we can add it to the list of observers by subscribing to that object. It's kind of like a magazine subscription. Or we can unsubscribe from the ob observable object. So when we don't want to observe that weather object anymore, we don't want to be called, uh, we don't want our method update to be called on the observer. When that object changes, we unsubscribe from it we basically delete that object from, remove that object from the list of observers. Then we have an interface observer, which will be implemented by the different observers, maybe an Android app, an iPad app, uh, a web app, and so on. Then we have the data, the weather data. So a weather data implements the observable interface. It contains, let's say the temperature and updating the temperature with a new temperature will basically update the temperature to the new temperature and then call the method publish. So the publish method is the one that actually calls with a new temperature all of the observers, tells all of the observers that the temperature has changed, okay? So now there is a new temperature, 48 degrees instead of the previous 42 uh, degrees, let's say. So now we have a weather station. A weather station basically has a, constru a constructor that subscribes to the current object. Uh, observers subscribe to the current object. Uh, the update method uh, takes an observable object and an object. And if the observable object is an instance of weather data and the object is an integer, then the temperature changes. Uh, uh, the station prints that the temperature is the new temperature that was taken as an input temp. A server observer weather uh, basically has a weather data object. Uh, we have station one, station two, multiple stations with the same data. We can update that data to 40 degrees. Then we can sub unsubscribe a station uh, we delete that station and then we can update to 35 degrees and see that before we had two stations, now we have uh, only one station. Okay. So the idea of this publish subscriber mechanism is that you have a subject object and multiple, uh, uh, multiple subscribers or observers. And these observers, first of all, they subscribe to that object and when the object gets updated, like the temperature of the object gets updated, then all of the observers are notified, okay? So I have this example, the weather station, and it's exactly what we expected, that when we had two different stations subscribed to the data, uh, when we update the data, both of the stations, station one and station two are actually updated but when one of them is unsubscribed and we update the data, then only one of them is updated, the, 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 the second one. 
So this is a standard way to actually uh, notify instead of pulling from the application the, the state of the object every single second, you only when the object changes, it pushes the notification to uh, the, the application, okay? So it basically, instead of calling from the observer, the observable object, you are calling actually from the observable object, the different observers. Okay. So let's see, there are a few questions and I want to respond to them from the chat. It would be more efficient and understandable if you make a subclass for each piece instead of the subclass can watch, watch for every move. Exactly. That's exactly what I wanted to say. That instead of every second pulling from the observer the state of the object, you actually, from the observable object, the data object, you are notifying the observers that they basically, uh, the data has changed. So that's the entire idea of uh, the observer pattern, okay? And in fact, as I said, the most useful uh, case for this kind of uh, pattern is actually in, uh, uh, in uh, graphical user interfaces. So let me actually skip over this example, which there are multiple subscribers to the same object and get to the actual template, the pattern per se. So you have a subject, which is usually an interface where there are the standard methods for registering a new observer, removing an observer and notifying all observers. And then you have an observer interface. And as you can basically see, the observe, it's a one to many uh, relationship. Usually you have a list of uh, multiple observers. Then you have a concrete object that implements the subject, like a concrete subject that implements actually how uh, observers are registered, removed or notified and how the state is changed and setting a new state actually calls the notify observers method after the state is changed. And then you have the observer uh, concrete classes which contain the standard method update, but implemented at the le level of observers. So for instance, uh, Android GUI uses different methods for updating the interface as opposed to an uh, iOS or an uh, OS X uh, GUI. Okay. So the concrete observers are those that are actually called when we want to notify all observers. So this is the standard design pattern for observers that are all notified through push notifications as opposed to pull notifications. And as I said, this is a standard graphical user interface uh, uh, design pattern. So all of you know J-trees, J-trees or trees in general in graphical user interfaces. So for instance, this is my uh, hard drive I have uh, actually, it's not my hard drive, it's some old hard drive that contains disks and uh, different compact disks. And usually you have, you edit the tree object and you have to go through the model. So a tree is uh, connected to a model. You get the model for that tree. The tree object, the graphical user interface actually observes that model. If you want to modify the tree in the user interface, you actually modify the model. The moment that you in, in insert new nodes or remove nodes or the nodes are changed, uh, the tree is notified through this observer. So the tree is observer and the tree model is the observable object. So all of these complex controls in graphical user interfaces have their own state. And no matter if they are tables or trees or lists, usually you have a model, which is the data structure itself. Uh, then you have the view, which is the observer for that data structure. And then you have the controller. And the controller is invoked when the view is changed. 
And the main uh, graphical user interface design pattern used, which uses this observer pattern is called model view controller, MVC. And it employs the observer, observer pattern. Basically the model is the data structure. It has no visual representation. It notifies the views through observer design pattern when something happened, like for instance, an node was added. The view is the observer. There is the visual representation in the GUI and it attaches itself it through, basically it sets itself as an observer to the model. The controller is the event handler. You can also see it as uh, an observer of the view. If the view is modified, the controller basically executes the listeners that are attached to that, uh, uh, to that uh, view. So this MVC pattern is as follows. The controller basically updates the data in the model, the model updates the data in the view, and uh, it's all a cycle. Basically, the model is observed by the view, the view is observed by the controller, the controller is observed by the, the model. Not always observed, but basically the controller modifies the model. It's really similar to calling the update method for the model. So GUIs love MVC. And these are examples of, again, how these are implemented for lists, for trees, for tables in uh, various, uh, uh, in Java F, uh, Swing. Any questions? So I will leave the next three design patterns for next class. Uh, the type of questions that we will have in the final exam are multi-choice questions like uh, what kind of uh, delegation is used in strategy and those the type of delegation is composition as opposed to template method which uses uh, inheritance. And then what kind of, uh, I'm giving you an example, let's say of uh, an observer design pattern and I'm asking which one of these patterns is employed. So I will try my uh, final to be totally uh, multi-choice questions. This way, by the end of the final, you can actually already see your score. Maybe not quite at the end of the final because we have to wait for everybody to finish the final. And then I will basically do the final grades based on uh, the, these, the, the questions, the grade from the final and the grade for the, fi the final project. So it's very important that you present your final project in the following Saturday, uh, December 11. Not this Saturday, but the following week on Saturday. So we are going to be done by uh, the time of the final with the project. And after the final, we can directly apply the syllabus grading schema to find the final grades. Um, will you have some sample questions like the previous exams for some practice, I will try by uh, maybe next class. So this way you will have a bunch of sample questions, but I can't make too many because basically, as I said, uh, I'm now settled with a new class and in the last week of classes and I don't have basically time enough to make a sample exam and a real exam. So, I will do my best to give you five sample questions, maybe. Okay. That's all for today. Thank you very much. And uh, see you next class.